Hey there, this is Dan. You're watching the Salty Sea. I'm going to be here with a uh, <laughs> wild, long brewing session. I've uh, made a few different Warcry lists for Warcry 2.0 um, because I want to talk about, you know, what you can expect, what kinds of things are going to be different, what lists are going to look like for this edition. We're going to have our first tournament pretty soon here, just in a few weeks at uh, the Nova Open. Uh, tickets are still available on sale. You can still get spots in the uh, first Warcry 2.0 tournament ever. Um, it's going to be pretty exciting and we're going to learn a lot from it. Now, any kind of list building, list creation that we do without any kind of tournament already done is all going to be, you know, pretty wild theory crafting, right? Um, because when you're building lists, obviously, you know, one of the things you do, and the main thing I would suggest that most people do is honestly just play what you think is sweet. Um, now, again, most people, when they watch kind of sort of war cry content, strategy content for any of these war games, you know, they're looking for what's competitive and then you're going to marry what you think is sweet with what's competitive, probably mix halfway in between, get some ideas maybe, maybe get some ideas of something powerful and then do kind of a, a sweet take on that. So, Obviously, that's something where I can't really help you sort of decide what you think is cool. I will sort of be creating lists like that in the future. I'll definitely have some uh, fun jank list building sessions. But uh, for now, I want to talk about kind of the difference between sort of competitive and just tuned list building. Um, because to be really competitive with your list building, you're really just looking to win a specific event and beat specific war bands in specific missions. Um, if you're really getting competitive with your sort of any kind of strategy, collectible strategy game, you really want to be thinking about the meta. And we don't really know what people are going to be taking to uh, Warcry 2.0 events yet. But what we can do is create really tuned lists based on kind of specific ideas around list building. So just lists that we know are going to be functional in a wide array of missions. We have the uh, mission packs. We know that there's four rounds and everything with Warcry 2.0. And we can create lists that are going to try to have a chance to beat a wide array of different things. We can also, if we want, make skew lists that uh, will definitely dominate some missions and just figure, hey, it doesn't matter if we uh, end up playing all those other missions. So I think when you go to do a tuned list, uh, the way you do it is going to kind of diverge based on a few things, um, especially with a new format like this, where, you know, everything is brand new. We haven't seen any competitive play in tournaments, sort of really testing things against each other. Everyone's personal testing is going to reveal different things. Um, so you can get to kind of a theory of the case. And I'll kind of explain what I mean by that. You can also just decide that you want to maximize the value of an ability or of a reaction. Or you can just say, hey, I think this fighter is really efficient. I'm just going to showcase this fighter, uh, spam as many of it as I can. And then maybe if there's a buff that works uh, especially well with that fighter, I'll just have that buff present in my list. Uh, a few different ways you can look at it. But I think... Um, I want to talk the most about sort of the, the idea of having a theory of the case or a, th a theory that you can go into a tournament thinking, I think this is the core change, the, the really the most important change between 1.0 and 2.0. And that's going to um, inform my list building because we don't have specific lists to beat. So we need to kind of identify specific trends to beat, I guess is what I'm saying. So what I mean by that is here's some reasonable kind of overarching theories that I've seen, either I've seen people put forward or um, I think are reasonable. Now, I only agree with about half of these. The reason I'm putting all of these out here is because I think it's important for you to be able to kind of look at these different ideas of what's going on and kind of make your own decisions with list building. Um, so why don't I just kind of go through them really quick. So one is move three fighters were over buffed is I think a reasonable thing that you could say. Um, a lot of very slow fighters went way down in points, um, just extremely far down in points. And the same is true of a lot of Toughness 5 fighters. So you could say, you know, you could build with this theory that Toughness 5 fighters are overbuffed and that you should really be relying on them. 
The other direction, you could say, listen, movement has always been king in this game. It always will be. I've taken a look at a lot of the missions. A lot of the missions require you to kind of get different places on the board. Uh, so you could say, listen, <laughs> nothing's changed from uh, in 1.0 when we needed to get moving. Uh, that's going to be true here too. Another thing, you know, free activation doubles are the strongest thing in Warcry. I've heard a lot of people say that. Uh, the same I've heard, but with nets. Nets are just anything that stops an, oppo an opposing model from activating. Um, you could also look at the kind of three new list building mechanics and the ally mechanic, the thrall mechanic, and the monster mechanic. And you could say with any of those three, I think, again, reasonably, that they are completely exploitable and that um, building a list looking to kind of use allies in a bad faith way or use monsters in a bad faith way um, could end up being the strongest thing. You could also look a lot of, I've been yelling about the mid-sized trap for, you know, over a year now. Um, and I think GW, if they weren't listening to me, they were kind of figuring it out in their own testing. A lot of the points went down on mid-sized models. Uh, if you wanted to, you could look at that and conclude that GW's, either they've solved the mid-sized trap or they're trying to solve it. Um, and you could build a list completely just based on that and going all for kind of mid-sized models. Uh, you could also just conclude that, listen, right now we're early in a format. People don't really know what they're doing. Intact 1.0 lists are just going to smash all the untuned experiments that people are running. Um, you could also say, listen, we've talked about reactions. If you play your first couple games and reactions seem to be more impactful than you thought, then you could conclude pretty reasonably that um, reactions equal horde meta, that you just want all the cheap fighters you want out there. Uh, oddly enough, you could also just conclude the opposite, right? Four rounds uh, essentially means chaff is dead, right? Uh, essentially, the theory behind that is uh, a lot of people, you know, you find uh, ever since the Tome of Champions came out and moved everything to four rounds, uh, you often find that, you know, cheap models that don't have a way to keep themselves alive, they often are dead by the time the end of round three comes ar around. You know, in Warcry 1.0, that didn't matter because they had scored so many points in rounds one, two, and the beginning of three that it didn't matter if they were all dead at the end of the game. Uh, but now with a whole fourth round, it matters a whole lot more. You could say that that means the chaff is dead. And it's hilarious to me because uh, there's pretty reasonable ways to argue for kind of both sides of something that are completely, completely incompatible. Um, the other one that I think is interesting is you could argue the reaction delta is too large. Now, this isn't necessarily saying that, um, you know, reactions equal horde meta or anything like that. It just means the difference, and I've heard a lot of people sort of comment this on um, my videos, sort of talking about what's changed and going over all the reactions of different factions. A lot of people sort of, uh, and whether this is knee jerk or not, a lot of people have said that the difference between the really good reactions and the really bad ones is just like wildly extreme. That's what I mean by the Delta. And um, if you want to try to kind of exploit that, I think that, you know, if you think that that's going to be the most important thing going on in the edition, then I think that that's a reasonable thing is to just go with a faction that has one of the better reactions. Um, so. I kind of took these principles, some of the ones I agree with, some of the ones I didn't, and I wanted to build lists kind of uh, showing examples of what it would be like to try to kind of maximize, say, two or three of these at the same time to kind of create some some ideas that can be sort of really good jump off points based on, you know, what you think is going to be important going forward in these editions. So these first two, uh, let's go with this Slanesh one. So the first one being Toughness 5 fighters were overbuffed. I'm going to say GW solved the mid-size trap and all these free action activation doubles, these are the things that are going to, going to define the game. They're the best thing you can do because, you know, just the rate that you get off of a double is so high. So this would be a list where you'd have a Slangor Slakehorn and two Slangor Fiendbloods. They get that free activation doubles, double. They're pretty quick. Um, 
And then you would pair them with three Myrmidesh Painbringers. Those are the Toughness 5 Slanesh Fighter that went way down in points. And then uh, you have just enough points left for a Twin Soul with Lash, just to give you a little bit more of a kind of arranged flexibility there. Um, so here you're just really going for the idea that your Myrmidesh are going to be really hard to kill. They're going to hold the ground. They do a reasonable amount of damage on their own. Um, you know, at 130, I in my kind of Slanesh uh, guide video, we talked about how at 130 they were kind of interesting, playable, maybe not the most competitive thing, but sort of getting there, getting interesting. Well, the move from 130 to 105 is pretty huge, right? So uh, this is definitely something that you could kind of take a look at and try out. Um, I'm going to be trying out these models. I've got this list, um, so I'll be you know doing it in some of my own testing. Uh, another one you could go with, though, again, two of the same principles, right? Going for toughness five fighters or high toughness fighters and GW having solved what to do with kind of these mid-size fighters. But you could also say, listen, I think all the M3, the movement three fighters, they all went way down in points, and I think that they were overbuffed. Um, so in this list, you would have three protectors, Adjudicator Prime with Boltstorm Crossbow, a Prosecutor with Hammers, and a Decimator. So the three protectors and the Decimator, the idea there is that you are making up for your sort of very slow three inch movement by having extra range. So a protector has got three inch range um, and they can cover a lot of the board. Uh, the decimator only has two inch range, but it fits with the points well and it does more damage than the protectors do. Uh, then, you know, you can still cover for those weaknesses by having your prosecutor flying around the board, by having your judicator prime shooting at things. Um, the judicator that does the most damage the one with the kind of special crossbow, that one did get a pretty big nerf. It went all the way up to 240 points, but they left the Judicator Prime alone and it still does pretty respectable damage and can definitely blow ch certain chaff off the board um, with just two shots. Uh, a similar list to this went three and one at Gen Con in 1.0 rules and the points went down. So now you can fit more stuff in the list. And I think this is a really interesting uh, way to start. Um, especially if you're, you know, going into an event where there's not a ton of running around, where you think that just one big prosecutor can probably do all of the flying around work that you need to have done. Those protectors are definitely going to hold the center. And, you know, like the other list, like the Slangor list, they do have a free activation double. Um, it's kind of hard to trigger. You have to be pretty careful sort of with your positioning because you have to get your opponent to damage something and then trigger before that thing has been killed. Uh, that can be, sometimes be tough against a savvy opponent because uh, they're going to have activation advantage on you, but, you know, still something you can do. And man, the hitting power of these protectors, uh, point for point, I don't know if there's anything in the game that, you know, can, can take one out. They really have to be um, outmaneuvered. And with that three inch range, outmaneuvering them is going to be really difficult or uh, take a lot of skill to do. And maybe not every list is going to be able to do it at all. Um, I wouldn't be surprised given that, you know, protectors, people were starting to play them before. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we uh, saw a lot more out of this model. Um, if you want, if you're interested about more of them, uh, you can check out the podcast uh, tabletop and beyond. They have a war cry podcast that I'm on with, uh, Justin and Jason and, um, Justin ran a protector heavy list at Gen Con to that three in one record. So you can kind of listen to his tournament recap and decide for yourself if that's something that's going to have staying power over the next edition. Now to go somewhere completely different, right? You could decide the monster mechanic is pretty exploitable. Then I've also kind of combined this with some move three fighters that were not, uh, didn't drop in points, but had dropped in points in the previous edition and just went up a toughness with essentially staying the same. Plague bearers are at 50 points and you get a lot for those 50 points. Um, and then there's this idea, you know, that having a ton of reactions, being able to counter all over the place, uh, 
is going to be really powerful. And here you have a really heavy hitting monster with the fact that you've got 10 models here, seven plague bearers, you're gonna be able to flood the board. You're gonna be able to win on a lot of objectives, especially with this sloppity bile piper kind of uh, pushing them across the board. You could go with two sloppity bile pipers and I think that'd be totally reasonable. I just wanted to at least write the pox bringer down here to just make sure I don't forget to mention it as um, it's a pretty efficient sort of damage per points leader uh, in the Nurgle space. Um, the exciting thing about the Chimera, right, is that these monsters, the amount of power you put in one small area just can't be matched. Um, so these monsters are going to win every single fight they get into, um, you know, even with kind of traditionally really scary kind of dragon and titan monsters, right? A Doombull is not going to beat a Chimera in a fight. Um, and, you know, those things, the whole game revolves around them, right? If you feel like having a piece where the whole game revolves around your piece is really important, I think going up one more notch to having a monster and then supporting it with enough bodies that you don't just insta instant lose your objectives, um, I think can be really powerful. Now, if I were going to do that, I would lean towards the really fast monsters, the flying monsters, because those big bases can be really difficult on certain Warcry boards. Um, now, if you say, think that the Nova open boards are gonna be really open, right? Because, you know, they'll use a sort of mix of terrain. Um, maybe some boards will be tough, some boards will be more open, more easy to position. Uh, then you'll be able to put your monster around and hey, let's say there's one where your monster kind of gets stuck and can't move anywhere, but then three where it doesn't and you just win all three of those easily. Three and one record's pretty good, right? So I think there's a lot of play that you can do with the flying monsters. Uh, Chaos has one, Death has two, although uh, between the zombie dragon and the terror geist, I can't remember which one is which, but they uh, one of them just has way better stats than the other one for a very similar points cost. And it's like, kind of weird and you don't know why that would be but um still the the better death one and the chimera i think there's a lot of play there a lot of things you can kind of experiment with and i'm excited to see if anybody tries it so let's go maybe a different direction where you're just on the idea that the best reactions are just so much better than the weakest reactions now i think the best reaction is gloom spike gets I do think that they paid for it in terms of the stats per point of a lot of their cheaper models, um, but their expensive models are still pretty good and they have access to incredible abilities and they're really fast. So nets, Gloom Spike Gits has two different net options. One is the Bogolai, which is uh, a member of the Gabapalooza, and the other is just the regular netter. Um, I think both are completely valid. Uh, here, the points work out a little bit better to just have three Bogolais and then two Sneaky Snufflers. Um, but you could kind of restructure a list that's mostly around Netters. I do think Netters are pretty easy to kill, but the idea being uh, if you're throwing Nets everywhere, then your opponent can't kill anything. Um, then you have the fact that sort of you only need one activation to throw a Net at something. And so then you can still use one of your activations to use a reaction. And the Gloom Spike gets reaction is incredible with kind of teleporting their cavalry straight into combat. All of these squig hoppers, they just bounce right onto you. They do a ton of damage. They're more fragile than they used to be, um, but you're going to be able to keep them safe behind your chaff because... Um, you know, you don't have to sort of fly in with them right away. You don't have to commit with them right away um, because you have this reaction to kind of blink them into combat and then attack twice before, you know, your opponent really gets to move in on them, right? They don't necessarily have to make a charge move and then get into it. You can spend a move from a much cheaper fighter. So I think there's a lot of really exciting stuff to experiment there with Gloom Spike Gits. I don't really think this is going to be you know, this one here, I don't think this is the definitive list. I think there's a lot of experimenting that you have to do. But I think this is a great list to start with if you're kind of not sure where to begin your experimenting with. I think the ideal list is going to end up looking different than this, but I think this is a great way to 
play this, test a few games, and then get to the ideal list after you've played this a little bit. I would be surprised if Gloom Spike gets are dominating right away. I think it's going to take a lot of time to figure out the best configurations to run them in. Now, let's say you want to go into maybe one of the other really good reactions. This one is the same as the Gloom Spike gets one. It just doesn't have as much of a range to it. Um, but then you want to go with sort of more points efficient stuff instead of leaning on abilities, right? Uh, so a lot of Iron Jaws are move three. A lot of Iron Jaws are toughness five. Both of those things generally went down in points. Iron Jaws, all of their stuff went down in points quite a bit. They also have the Brutes where um, in objective missions, if they're being sort of out flooded on the board by a ton of chaff, they can just pick one objective, use their triple on it, say you mess in, and then the triple being called you mess in. And then all of a sudden the numbers advantage for your opponent doesn't matter at all. I think um, Iron Jaws are really interesting that way with the kind of uh, difference between the good reaction and the good ability and the fighting stats. And you, of course, have Wah to get things into play. Wah was nerfed from going from all of the dice to half of the dice, but I think it's still really solid. Um, you could also drop the Gore Chop a Brute for two more Ard Boys and then use your Brute Boss with Claw. Um, you could get a slightly higher impact leader because you'd have a few more points to play with there. Um, I don't know which way you want to go, but I think this is a really interesting way to, to do it, right? You're wanting an Ard Boy in every deployment group uh, using their sort of, especially in the second round, um, you know, because right away you're going to be trying to rush forward using Wa with whatever deployment group the Brute Boss is in. But then, you know, once you get there, uh, your opponent is going to probably try to stay away from your really scary brutes, your brute boss, your brute with the gore choppa, um, and then you can really force them to engage those scary models by using the Iron Jaws reaction, and that can be a real problem for your opponent. So I think there's a ton of play in Iron Jaws. Um, again, because this reaction is so similar to the... Um, to the Gloom Spike gets one because there's so many moving pieces with Iron Jaws between uh, needing to get that wah going on the first turn, needing to have you messing available for the, um, you know, for the possibility of making sure that you don't get overwhelmed on objectives, uh, wanting to have a Gorgrunta available because they're incredibly high impact now and they can give you a lot of value um, in the deployment group that doesn't have wah going. Uh, Lots of moving pieces, but again, this I think is a really excellent place to start and a list I would be really frightened of and probably something that I will try to test out at some point here. Now, I talked about Iron Jaws being able to really mess with the Horde armies, but I wanted to at least go talk about what some of those Horde forces might be. These are two different 14 model lists. Of course, you can go all the way up to 15 if you want, but I think that the extra value in numbers that you get from 15 doesn't really give you much compared to um, 14, right? Each each individual fighter on the margin, the marginal advantage for numbers is lower. Um, but let's first talk about this KO list. Uh, this one's theorizing basically that the ally mechanic is exploitable, move three fighters are overbuffed, and reactions equal horde meta, essentially, right? It's the idea that just having a ton of things that can react and counter everything, um, counter having like a strict floor on the value of a fighter now because you can't just take out a fighter and, you know, stop it from ever activating again. It's still going to get a couple licks in. Um, the idea there is that that really increases the value of your cheapest fighters. So you can go with an Aether Chemist two Tempest Eye allies to put in two different deployment groups, um, a Guard Master and an Old Guard. I think those are probably your two best um, ones for the points. I've been making a lot of lists that have um, Keeper of the Gates in them. It's basically an Old Guard for a few more points um, that just has slightly better combat stats. I think the Old Guard is much better, but a lot of the time I just have some extra points in the list and end up with the Keeper of the Gate. Um, but the Guard Master is another really good option to have a ranged 
ranged sort of option in your list. I think having one of each, if you really like order and you really like playing around with order, I think it's worth it probably to have one of each of these. Um, and then you would just flood the board with Arcanauts. Those pistols are gonna add up in a big way and you're gonna have huge activation of advantage. So there's no one who your opponent is gonna really be able to attack that you can't counter with because um, you get to choose you know, who you activate first. They don't, um, well, they choose who they activate first, but they don't really get to dictate the pace of the game because you're activating and then you know, they're doing everything and then you get to move everything once they're done. So. I also included two Arcanauts with Sky Pike here, um, just because the spear is incredibly um, damage efficient, sort of point for point. It's, you know, the Arcanaut with Sky Pike, it's basically like a Grave Guard. It, it does an incredible amount of work and it has range two, which is always nice with those move three fighters. Um, another option, you know, very similar philosophy that you can pull off is doing the same thing in Soul Blight Grave Lords. Necromancers, of course, have that. Uh, quad that everyone loves that sort of uh, puts all of their fighters near all their minion fighters nearby into absolute overdrive so you could pair that with 11 minions uh, seven grave guards with the big blade four skeletons um, i actually my algorithm really likes the grave guards with shields as well now um, though the points just work out better here to have you know all of the 65 point ones and you know, the 65.1 still gives you more than the shield does. It just, point for point, I think the shield one is pretty good. Uh, but what you would do here is you would have that Necromancer, but you'd have two Flesh Eater Quartz allies. Uh, they can kind of, at least the Crypt Gas Courtier can kind of have a real impact on the board on it in its own right. But really what they're there for is that to make sure that one of your deployment groups is going to be in the action right away. The Flesh Eater Quartz ability, you know, really boosts movement. It's one of the last ones, just that and Tempest Psy, that do the full dice movement. And that's really powerful. So you'll be able to get your whole horde into position right away. Skeletons and Grave Guard, point for point, they give you a lot for what you're paying for, probably because they got that move three buff. Um, and so then if you can sort of get them into position in round one and then somehow roll a quad in rounds two or three while you still have a lot of them on the board, uh, your opponent's going to be in a really difficult position. So this gives you a ton of really powerful options. You know, whether you'd rather do this or the Karadran Overlords version of this sort of full horde rush uh, is really up to you whether you're a believer more in the Necromancer or whether you're a believer in, you know, having eight inch pistol shots everywhere and just being able to reach out and touch people um, because you know that having these shooting abilities you know and things like four corners um you know the the mission where you have to be in each quadrant of the board that can be really powerful um the real question to me is whether these lists can win um there's <laughs> there's missions in the current packet called reaper and treasure hunters that are really rough on horde factions um, there's also various hunter mission cards that can be kind of rough when all you have are hordes. Um, you know, sometimes you really want like a high impact fighter or two, and that's generally going to come out of your numbers budget, essentially. Um, so there's questions about whether these lists can succeed in every mission, but if you test out those missions, if you test out Reaper, if you test out Treasure Hunters with these Horde lists and you find it's working okay for you, you could be in a really powerful position trying these out. You can also, and this is really kind of wild, you can make lists that barely look like their faction and um, there can be kind of some advantages to doing that. So here's a list kind of going off the idea that the Thrall mechanic is exploitable, uh, that movement is really important, and on the theory that you know, G Games Workshop has found ways to make mid-size models matter. So, uh, I'd start with the Infernal and Rapturous. It has a shooting attack. It has um, a really nice sort of AOE debuff. Then I'd bring in a Plague Priest. Uh, it's fast. It's got six-inch movement. It's got two-inch range. It's got um, an incredibly impactful sort of damage buff ability. Then you could use Thralls to essentially give those two bodyguards. So you could have a Chaos Warhound and a Razor Gore. Thralls have this incredible um, reaction that if anything comes within 
uh, you know, melee range three inches, I believe, of one of their, it's either three or one, but it's when something goes up to attack one of the leaders of your warband, uh, your thrall can spend an action to move and then attack. Uh, so you basically just get a free action anytime your thrall is within hitting range of um, one of your leaders and someone tries to go attack them in melee. That's incredibly powerful. So I've got these two thralls that both move eight inches to give them a really wide protection aura and just have a ton of speed on the board in general. Then you can also have the Fiend of Slanesh, which also moves eight inches. So you you've got four different eight inch move fighters. You've got a six inch move fighter. Your last demon net is five inch move. Um, so you really only have one slow fighter and otherwise you're just really flying around the board, but using things that kind of have a respectable kind of point for point output, right? The razor gore can really take things down. Um, the fiends can really take stuff down. And then your plague priest is really going to sort of boost damage all over the map, right? So. I think this is kind of a really interesting and exciting way to build a list because uh, it just doesn't look anything like lists looked in 1.0. Um, you know, this is technically a Slanesh list and it's got three fighters that aren't Slanesh at all. Um, so, you know, for some people who kind of like the sort of narrative of their faction, don't like soup lists, I can see this being kind of offending to the senses. Um, but I think it's really interesting from a list building perspective. I also think it's really interesting because a lot of the 10 inch move flyers uh, took really huge nerfs. And so I think it's really worth, because movement is still important. It's clearly important in the, um, in the mission packs. The question is, is movement on the models too expensive now to put all your chips in the basket, right? So I think it's definitely worth, um, sort of experimenting with some of the slower fighters that didn't take quite as hard nerfs, but are still very fast, right? Things like fiends running eight inches as opposed to flying 10 inches, things like that, that are still very fast around the board, but didn't hit quite the big nerfs that, uh, that the 10 inch move flyers did. You can also, you know, port 1.0 lists directly into 2.0, right? So you can have this idea that, listen, the, the principles haven't changed. I still want to be building lists the same way I built lists in 1.0. It's just the points have changed. So I'm going to go for, you know, whatever the most points efficient version of the same role is, but just do the same roles, the same everything that I did in 1.0. So really good example of that. Um, I wanted to take the third place list um, from Darcy at uh, Adepticon and kind of just make some changes, right? So. Um, you could play a blood kind, which is basically a small doom bull. It's a uh, bull gore boss. You could still have your cockatrice. Yes, it went up 20 points, um, but it's still flying around the board doing all of the really incredible things it did in the previous edition. You know, the cockatrice was one of the kind of defining pieces of the game. Um, once people kind of finally got to do competitive play. Uh, then you could either take another Bulgor. Um, they gave some pretty big buffs to one of the bigger Bulgors that cost 195, but it got a, a whole extra attack from what it had in first edition. Or you could play two Bestigors because those went down in points. And if you put them both in the same deployment group, uh, those can essentially double as one big threat model because they're not going to get one shot off the board. So they're both going to get their licks in um, to whatever comes after them. Then you would just have five chap fighters. Now, again, the points have changed. Uh, your regular gore with two weapons went up a little bit in points. Uh, the ungor went down to be more in line with the gore. So you could do, you know, test out two of your regular gore, but then also try out three ungor with spears. Um, so the really attractive thing about this list is that it's really similar to a 1.0 list that was very successful. Uh, the only difference is, you know, just tinkering with which fighter is in which role, uh, just based on what points have changed. Uh, I think that that can be just a really solid way to approach a new edition really often. I know like when Magic the Gathering formats kind of rotate, a lot, a lot of the time uh, the most successful things are just whatever the best 
aggressive deck was in the previous you know with the cards that are still left from the previous edition uh, a lot of the time in the first few weeks that's the most powerful thing to be doing um this would kind of be you know this isn't a purely aggressive list but this would kind of be going on the same philosophy uh some other ways to kind of do that mixing with ideas from the current one right you could take a soul blight grave lords list and say Listen, I'm just going to bring in an ally to exploit the ally mechanic, but then still essentially be going with what was good in 1.0, right? It's very similar to the SBG list I showed in the kind of all horde one, except here you're going, listen, in 1.0, big flyers were just incredibly efficient, incredibly incredibly just important for succeeding on the missions. So I'm going to keep running my Vargoyle even though it went up 20 points. And I'm just getting that back with how much cheaper all my minions have gotten. Uh, then you can still have a Necromancer if you want to. Uh, you can definitely let one go. I think Necromancers were a bit of a trap in the previous edition where you could still win with them because Graveguard and Zombies were so good. But I think that they were just strictly less powerful than the Vargoyle lists. And then here you're going, listen, I used to be playing Virko's Bloodborne in this role, but they went up quite a bit in points. So why don't I just get my movement from an ally, right? So if you have a Crypt Ghast here for just 105 points, you have access to um, the incredible triple that kind of boosts all your movement around the Crypt Ghast. And so you're kind of putting your movement just in a different way. And so you can have your Vargoyle in one deployment group, your Crypt Ghast in one of the other two deployment groups, and then still have a very similar movement package than to what you had before in 1.0. And then, you know, you can have three Skeleton Warriors, four Graveguard with the Big Blade, two Graveguard with Sword and Shield. And that's just like a huge pack of nine, just incredibly points efficient, um, chaff models that are going to be just really, really powerful on any kind of objective mission. Um, Graveguard were one of the best things to be doing in 1.0. I don't think that has changed in 2.0. Um, you can also kind of try something similar though, saying, listen, you know, we have the move three stuff from Soul Blight Grave Lords, but OCR Bone Reapers also has move three stuff. It was also toughness five. It got really big buffs. Uh, you can still bring in an ally, um, and then this can kind of be somewhat of a 1.0 list, although, you know, you don't have a big flyer. Um, now, Oceanic Bone Reapers can access pretty big flyers in the Morgasts, but this list would go with um, a Mordizen Soul Mason for the party buff to attacks, a Crypt Ghast to get the extra movement. Now... Um, Oceanic Bone Reapers does have their own movement buff. It just does half the value of the dice instead of the full value. So it's a little less powerful. Um, so having the Crypt Ghast instead of, say, a Mortec Hecatos uh, does give you a little more movement there. And then Stalkers, you know, they have the thing that was powerful in 1.0, which is those free movement doubles. Uh, stalkers get the the one where if you have an opponent within six inches, you can get a free movement as long as you end up closer to them than you were before, which you can kind of cheat around with, use kind of in bad faith to be, yes, I'm closer to that opponent, but I'm actually, you know, fighting something else. Um, then six more tech that are toughness five, move three, um, you know, they do a ton of damage with their counters because... Your opponent is going to miss a lot when they're attacking them. I think this is really interesting. Um, there's just a lot you can kind of play with with OCR Bone Reapers. I really don't think, you know, I don't think this list is the be-all end-all. I think it's really interesting whether or not you want the FEC ally at all with them. I think it's really interesting, you know, whether you want to um, upgrade one of those stalkers to a um, Morgast and maybe move the Mortis and Soul Mason down to a Hecatos, something like that. There's a lot you can play with with Oceanic Bone Reapers, um, just going off the idea that having a couple really strong elites with just, you know, five to seven more tech guard, uh, just holding the fort and having counter, um, you know, just a lot you can play with there on under the idea that, you know, maybe these Toughness 5 chaff with their or with their reactions are going to be really solid. 
Finally, <laughs> I wanted to kind of talk about um, one sort of whole swath of the game that has been nerfed quite a bit, and that's um, elves and everything that looks like an elf. All of those things, you know, everything that acts like an elf. All of the elves kind of took pretty major points, um, you know, hits to their points. Uh, that's partly because for a lot of 1.0, they were kind of the, the best stuff to be going around with. Things like, you know, Daughters of Cain, Sisters of Slaughter with their two inch move and their five in or sorry, their five inch move, their two inch reach, their really solid damage profiles. A lot of those things, um, you know, a Kel or a Namardi Thralls were really solid. A lot of those are really good or were really good in 1.0. A lot of those took really sort of heartbreaking nerfs in 2.0. So let's say you just want to keep the elf hope alive. I think Oral and Wardens are really interesting. They feel like elves still. They move five inches. They have that incredible three-inch reach. So you're going to be able to create huge bubbles because you have a lot of Oral and Wardens that um, can kind of have these overlapping threat ranges. And then you also have the Stone Guard, which lets you play in the idea that maybe move three stuff has been buffed a little bit much. Um, you could certainly add in a... Uh, Tempest Eye ally instead of the Achillean King here, but you know I wanted to keep it all elf and have a really interesting dragon piece because um, you know Eidneth Deepkin took really hard nerfs, but I do think Achillean Kings are really good. I think all of their kind of cavalry still are really solid. Um, so I think there's a lot you can play with in this list. You have 10 models, so you're going to be in a really solid place for objectives. But you've got that Achillean King model that can kind of dictate the pace of play so that an Elite Warband can't just table you right away. Um, also, the Stone Guard are really hard to table really quickly. So you're going to have a lot of hitting power for you know what you would call kind of a, a squishy elf list. Now, these five Orlin Wardens are really squishy, but that three-inch move is going to help keep them alive. So... I think if you are a huge lover of elves and you're kind of sad at where most of the elves are in this edition, which I think is a very reasonable reaction to have, um, this is kind of a list that you can toy around with and see if it works for you and, you know, <laughs> keep your elves on the board. So this is going to be my last video for a little while. I'm going to be painting and uh, playing for Nova Open. Um, if anyone's in the Twin Cities and wants to play Age of Sigmar, I have to learn that game before Nova Open. I played a pretty decent amount of 2.0, but I have not actually played 3.0 yet. I've just been like, I've only done Warcry for this whole last year that 3.0 has been a thing. So um I have to like play a 3.0 game at least once before Nova because I am playing in the Warcry event and I'm playing in the Age of Sigmar event. So uh, hit me up if you want to teach me 3.0 uh, in the Twin Cities sometime. But um, otherwise, I just want to talk about how thankful I am for all of my patrons. I, what, released six videos in two weeks, um, basically chronicling all of the changes. And it's really, you know... The community that they've created, uh, both on my Discord, on you know the comments of my videos, getting to know some of them in person, having met them at events, um, that community is really helpful. And just knowing that that support is there is basically just makes it a lot easier to make these videos. So um, really, really excited. And if you know if the last sort of deluge of content that I've been putting out since Warcry 2.0 has come out. If that has kind of helped you at all, please consider uh, joining up. You can just do it for um, anywhere from two dollars a month to a whole bunch more, depending on what kinds of um, you know what kind of support that you feel is right for you. So um, yeah, come on and join. Until then, um, I am going to be sort of once Nova happens, I'm going to put out quite a bit of videos covering what went on there. And so um, since I'll probably be quiet for a week or so before that. Uh, make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell icon so it does show up on your feed um, so that you don't miss it because whatever happens at Nova, it's going to be exciting because it's going to be the first ever tournament for 2.0. We have no idea what's going to be kind of actually winning once the rubber hits the road. And it's going to be really fun to kind of try that out and test it out. So um, until then, may all your rolls be crits. <laughs>